Hey guys, I don't know if you started already, but we can't hear you online. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, now we can. Okay, I may have to, uh, I may have to wear this if that doesn't work. Okay. Pressing on, I, should I, should I start the slide? Should I start the presentation you over? Can start over yeah. Okay, I'm happy to, I'm happy to do that for the, for the video recording. Yeah, for the video. Okay. Let's, let's go back. All right, rewind. And ask Check Joe. the box. Yeah. Joe. Yeah, ask Joe if he can hear. Joe, can you hear us okay now? Yeah, I, yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, all good. All right, well. Thank you, Lisa, for having me here today. <laughs> I'm so I'm so excited. To, I'm so excited to be here because I think that this topic fits so nicely with the piece together theme of this year's library exhibition. Um, I'm excited to share a little bit of, uh, of our family history, um, share with you a story about researching our own county's history, and then in close, share some resources that I hope will help you to create a little bit of, uh, of your own stories and share that with your own family. So let's uh, start with a little placemaking and talk about some of the general area in which today's stories take place. All right. This is a satellite image of what I would describe as the Sandy Valley area. Um, this space is a space that extends just north outside of the Hillsborough city limits and then eastward in the direction of Festus in the Herculaneum area. Um, it's a space that encompasses the headwaters of Sandy Creek, which generally speaking, um, start right here in the area that's encompassed around the Jefferson College campus. We have that pond out front that you see when you enter onto campus and as you go northward, a lot of those uh, little, little, little hillside tributaries and dry creeks collect and then form what becomes Sandy Creek as it flows in the direction of the Sandy Creek Covered Bridge, which as many of you may be familiar, is this beautifully preserved covered bridge and state park that's just a few miles from here and is one of only four covered bridges remaining in the state of Missouri. And so Sandy Creek then kind of makes a turn near that bridge and then heads eastward where it eventually joins the Joachim Creek outside of Herculaneum and then of course flows into the Mississippi. Um, it's home to not just one, but two of our region's oldest congregations in both the Sandy Baptist Church and the Zion Lutheran Church. And then, of course, features hundreds of acres of farmland, some of which is still being farmed by families that are nearing that century farm designation. So this space sets the stage for today's presentation, um, not only because so much of our story takes place in and around the Sandy Valley area, uh, but it's also a place that's a bit dear to me because of my family's ties to the area going back uh, some 170 years at this point in time. So I'd first like to introduce you to my family, which is like so many of the families that were immigrants to the Midwest and across the country during that era of great German immigration that was happening in the mid-1800s. So this is the Lindhorst family in the year 1851. Um, thanks to Ancestry.com, we have access to some great records that have never before been available digitally. Um, what we're seeing here is a copy of the ship log uh, from the boat that brought our earliest Lindhorst ancestor to the United States. From this record, we can determine that Johann Hermann Lindhorst and his wife and family traveled from Steinhagen, Germany, and via the port at New Orleans. Uh, they eventually traveled north and then settled in the Sandy Valley area. Um, one thing that we don't have within the family is a photograph of Johann Hermann Lindhorst. But um, according to census records, uh, like so many others, he was a farmer by trade, we do know exactly what he was doing in the fall of 1858, very particular. This is a photo that came from an actual hard copy document that's here in the Jefferson College uh, Historical Center. Um, and it, it features Johann Hermann's signature. And so this is from a probate record. It's dated October 10th, 1858. And in this record, he's acknowledging the passing of a family member. And as administrator of the estate, he's applied his signature to this and about a half a dozen other documents um, that are stored in, in that probate record and here in our history center at the college library. And there are hundreds of variety of different documents in probate and other, uh, other history center documents. If you haven't had a chance to um, take a look at that list of records online or just go and visit with our library staff, I highly recommend that. You may find something um, to add or aid in your own historical research along the way. So according to records, um, Johann Hermann lived on a farm um, a few miles east of the covered bridge. And he would pass away some 30 years after the signing of that particular probate record. Um, but as the earliest ancestor in the US, his immigration to Jefferson County back in the 1850s, that would be the beginning of the family name that still lives in the area today. So his son, Henry Herman Lindhorst, would settle on a piece of property 
very near his father in the late 1870s. If you're familiar with Villa Antonio Winery or that space that's out on Lindhorst Road, we have Mr. Henry Herman Lindhorst and his ownership of that property at the right place at the right time for that naming designation. So family stories would indicate that, that, that Henry Lindhorst passed away at a relatively young age of 53 um, after a stomach ailment and of course he left behind his family, a wife uh, and several children. So as it turns out, Henry's son Ernst Lindhorst would settle his own farm and raise a family during the Great Depression, just a few miles away from there. Ernst and Ruth Mengelsdorf Lindhorst were my great-grandparents, um, and although uh, my great-grandmother passed away shortly before I was born, I did have the pleasure of getting to meet and know my great-grandfather a bit when I was at kindergarten or early elementary age. I do have some, some memories of him uh, when I was very little. So what would happen in the 1940s is that Ernst and his family would sell their property and then move the family farm to, the, to where the Lindhorst know it as today, just north of the Covered Bridge, the state park there on Old Lima Ferry Road. And so although my grandfather and his siblings were born and weathered pretty much all of the Great Depression on that previous farm, my grandfather would raise his family on this new property in the 50s and 60s, which includes my father Larry and his four siblings. My dad is here with us today. And then in the 90s, my parents, my brothers and I, we would move to the farm and into that farmhouse where my dad and his siblings were raised. And then in the late 2010s, I'd be blessed to be able to build my own home on that family property. So again, we've been blessed to continue some family traditions, making apple butter annually for many years. This is a photo of Ernst Lindhorst, my great-grandfather in the mid-70s, stirring the pot of apple butter that we continue to stir to this day. Each year, the family gets together, um, and um, we, we pack lots of apples, lots of sugar, and stir that over an open fire for about eight hours. Uh, you mix in a little cinnamon, spices, and, and then plenty of people to help jar and can that. And um, what would have been a traditional way to keep fresh fruit on hand back in those winter months many, many generations ago, we continue to do that and divvy the apple butter up uh, on an annual basis every year. So as I understand it, um, with the exception of, of course, the recent pandemic, which we took a little pause there, uh, and World War I, the family's been making uh, apple butter annually going back um, probably as far back as the 1880s. It's kind of what we've estimated. Um, so if you're familiar with the Kimswick Apple Butter Festival or, the, or, or that, that, that process, we're talking about something pretty, pretty similar to that. So we're blessed with some, some beautiful views. This is a photo I took uh, last fall. Um, and um, as it turns out, um, doing a little historical research on the property itself, uh, the farm had a little bit of history to share with us along the way. So this is a photo from around the early 40s, um, just after the family had moved to the farm. And you can see my, in this shot, you can see my, my grandfather's youngest sister. That's my great aunt. She's on the sled there at the bottom. Um, the house that's pictured behind them once functioned as a post office for what was then considered the town of Golden, Missouri. Um, but not exactly in the same context as it's photographed here. So the story as researched and we discovered that the house that's pictured here when it functioned as a post office actually sat about a tenth of, the, a, tenth of a mile from, from where it's photographed here. And when the post office was decommissioned in the, early, in the early 1900s, that house was physically removed from its foundation and then rolled on logs with either a team of horses or oxen to the place where, it, where it's photographed here, at which point the current owners added to the home and lived it in until my great-grandparents bought the property in the 40s. And so, unfortunately, this farm would succumb to um, dilapidation and some damage, termite damage, et cetera, and they were forced to tear that, that home down uh, in the early part of the, the 50s, at which point they built a new home on the site. But what a, great, what a great photo that contains both family and historical context in one shot. So, speaking of that new home, you can see that up on the hillside in the back. Um, and what little is left of that old farmhouse sitting back behind it there. They had, they had finished the new home and hadn't quite started or finished tearing down the old property. My great-grandparents were farmers by trade. Um, they would farm the, this 80-acre tract until their retirement, and then at which point they would um, start renting that farm ground to area farmers, and, and we continue to keep crops in rotation on the property uh, to this day, so, so many uh, decades later. So in this picture, which is from the mid-50s, um, the little guy in the front there, that's my dad. And then he's with his uncle, my great uncle, Orville. And they're, uh, they're hanging out talking about the corn harvest. So uh, question hypothetical, of course, is 
why, why bother share all of this uh, placemaking and uh, history of the family with you all today? Um, I, uh, as, as I, along with others in the family, started researching our family origins, um, I took an interest not so much in the genealogical perspective, but in the, in the historical perspective of the area in which we lived over all of the years. And so what I discovered then is that quite literally in the backyard of some of these previous gen Lindhorst generations, and others of course, uh, was a lead mining operation that predates the Civil War uh, by almost 40 years, going back quite a ways. Um, so as curious as I was about this development, I, fo I, I followed that trail of information which led in the direction of rediscovering a bit of forgotten Jefferson County history that was known as Sandy Mines. And so the question becomes, what was Sandy Mines? Well, um, Sandy Mines was a lead mining operation. Um, it um, was a, maybe quite possibly the most northern point of the um, a more extensively mined Washington County and Southern Jefferson County mines. And then at its most active period was about a mile in length. Um, and at times had uh, shafts and tunnels that were as deep as 100 to 150 feet below ground. So in the inset photo that you can see here, this is what would be called floating lead or surface lead ore. And a gentleman that joined us today brought some from his own property with us. So I've got some, got some here in person. This is the kind of stuff that you'd find that you'd be able to kick up with your boot or your shoe and kind of walking around the area of where mining might occur. And these things, these are, these are really big pieces. Most of, the, of what I have discovered or seen uh, around the Sandy Mines area have been anywhere from dime to nickel size or smaller, um, little flecks of lead more so than, than the bigger rocks that we have have with us today. So setting the timeline around when Sandy Mines was, was most active, um, if you take a look at the early part of the country, I mean, the early part of Missouri, um, Louisiana Territory is acquired in 1803, Missouri becomes a state in 1821, and then our, mo our, our first credible evidence of operations, of discovery, and mining happening at Sandy Mines is right around the corner in 1824. So we're only three years out from the, 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 the creation of Missouri as a state when Sandy Mines is being, uh, being uh, mined and operated. And then in about 100 years later, 1917, we have our last credible source regarding operations at Sandy Mines in the form of a bit of a newspaper snippet indicating that we're hoping to get mining happening again. But that's really where any, anything related to Sandy Mines kind of drops off and, and we don't hear a lot about it after that. So why was Sandy Mines? It's, it's in the right physical location. Like I mentioned, that Missouri lead belt, that's that lead producing area of southeastern Missouri. Um, it does extend deep into Washington County, if you know the Potosi and Old Mines area, and then into St. Francis as well, and Doe Run and the uh, um, uh, lead smelting facilities that are uh, uh, further south than, um, than, than where we are here, south of DeSoto, extending into Washington County. Um, the Sandy Mines as a space exists in the right place at the right time because it's so close to the Lee May Ferry Road. We consider that old Lee May Ferry Road today, but at one point that was the main thoroughfare from those areas of the south, the Potosi area through DeSoto, and then eventually crossing uh, the ferry at um, uh, 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 Merrimack, excuse me, and into St. Louis County and St. Louis City. And so you're only a few miles off of the old Lee May Ferry Road uh, in terms of being able, being able to adjoin a main thoroughfare and being able to get to and from the main parts of town. And then as I mentioned with regard to my own family, um, this growing population, you have, a, you have an influx of immigrants, people that are looking for work and they're settling their, their own homesteads and they're looking for things, um, things you know, to, to, uh, to help them um, uh, grow and, and homestead uh, for their own families. And so during this time frame, you'll see a lot of census records that indicate people in the Hillsborough area, in particular the Sandy Mines area, that claim miner as their main um, occupation. It's not, not uncommon to see that kind of flux in and out of the various census records. And then there's a need for the lead-based products. Um, if, you, if you're familiar with the uh, history of, of the city of Herculaneum, it's founded as a lead smelting town. Um, and the um, uh, uh, Herky would have been a main destination for a lot of this ore as it would have been smelted into uh, musket balls or ammunition and to shot or other things like that. This is uh, a mural that uh, is uh, 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 at our state capitol in Jefferson City. The title here is Herculaneum, where shot was made for the War of 1812. So if we imagine Sandy Mines as a, as a township similar to this, I think we can probably imagine something quite similar, a lot of little outbuildings, maybe some uh, encamped encampments for uh, miners here and there. 
And then, um, you know, just kind of a little township that grows around the mining operation itself. So my story really, really begins as a history lost, growing up and, and having a lot of family history, um, you know, that, that, that presents itself as, um, as I grew older. Um, I just became curious, like I said, about the places around the, the uh, Sandy Valley area. And in talking with, with my dad and with my, with my grandparents and other people that had grown up in the area, they knew about Sandy Mines, but considered it something that was very old. And so even having grown up in the Great Depression, they didn't really consider Sandy Mines as something that, that they really even knew anything about. And so there were a lot of people in the area that were certainly aware of the mine, but really unsure of its history in, in, in and of itself. So uh, we also have subsequent landowners that had taken to farming those fields that had once been uh, shafts or tunnels or sinkholes and things and filled those in. And those were just reclaimed as farmland. And then when you add in um, the state park element, to the Sandy Creek Covered Bridge, and one of its one of uh, one of only four remaining bridges in the state, you kind of that kind of draws away any sort of context away from maybe finding out more about uh, uh, the other history. As some of the focus then becomes Sandy Creek and uh, the beautiful covered bridge there at the park. So for me, research began by just wondering what the internet had the off had to offer in terms of Sandy Mines, and so. I started with, uh, with a search, going to all the search engines and putting Sandy Mines in and hitting enter. And so it, it turns out that it was just a unique search term that there just wasn't a lot of junk, not a lot of spam that came up. But what I discovered was there was this website and that website, and now all of a sudden I had a dozen or maybe 18, maybe 20 different websites that are all pointing to different little pieces of information regarding this place right down the road from the farm called Sandy Mines. So I, I continue to be curious found my way to another website called Google Books. This is, a, um, this is a site where Google had taken a lot of much more verbose documents like geologic surveys or railroad reports, and they had digitized those and then indexed those, so those had become searchable. So I was also finding little bits of information from websites like this that were more historical but scholarly type journals, and I was seeing little bits and pieces of that, of, of that there as well. And then I, I thought I knew what I thought I knew and started pinning things within the software of uh, Google Earth. And if you're familiar with Google Earth at all, that's that piece of software that allows you to take a, a satellite image, you can pin, you can uh, put, put, put markers, you can um, draw a, a mileage between point A to point B and do a whole lot of really neat things from a satellite perspective. So I started putting some sort of uh, 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 hypothesized place names on Google Earth and just sort of set that over to the side and wondering if I could come up with my own X marks the spot in terms of Sandy Mines at, at some point in time. And then again, coming back to the, the college's history center, uh, my office as a college employee is one door away from our library. And so I spent a considerable amount of time talking with our library staff and visiting with them in the history center where I discovered that they had a wealth of historical documents, maps, previous research, and other odds and ends that had, had found their way to our history center that were on file there. And um, I was able to put my hands on some hard copy and take a look at, take a look at some, some, some things that the, in and of themselves have some historical context. And then came the day, about a month after I started all of this, and I came home from work, and my wife says, hey, take a look at page two of the newspaper. Is this the mine that you're researching? And so on that day, um, we're looking at a, an article that just coincidentally lands in the newspaper that says the Department of Natural Resources is due to close an old mine shaft in Jefferson County. And so I took a look at this, and it's tough to see here, but it's at 4200 Sandy Church Road in Hillsboro. And so that, this, is, this, you know, this is beyond you know, belief. This is something that's coincidental. So I opened up the old phone book and found the, uh, the property owner and just simply gave her a call. She answered, and we got to talking, and being just a few minutes away from the farm, a couple of days later, we were out on her property, taking a look around, and I had found what I thought then was my first, what became many, X marks the spot events. And so what you're seeing in this photo here is this humongous sinkhole that goes down probably 75 feet or longer, and went in talking with her, I don't know if the, uh, if the laser pointer will do any justice in here, but in the upper left corner, you can see... You can see uh, Mrs. Volk, she's up there in the corner. So it's this great big sinkhole. And it, um, it had been something that always existed on her family's property. And it's hundreds of yards off of any main roads. But the, but the concern here was that 
there were a lot of abandoned mines in the Jefferson County area over all of these decades, and basically the state and federal government had lost track of them. Well, there was some grant money available, and so when she was having a contractor on site to do some renovations, she had pointed this out, and he had pointed her in the direction of just simply call the state, call the kind of the 1-800-Missouri hotline and see if you get anybody. And sure enough, they came out and said, yeah, we, we, we thought this might have been here. And they, they then made plans to come out and fill in this hole and kind of reclaim this like so many of the other farm areas around, around this area had been reclaimed as farmland themselves. So she put me in touch with the Department of Natural Resources, which as it had, turns out, had also been to the site before I had been there. And so they had brought a, uh, an exploring crew. There's, um, I think, four people in this shot. Um, and so this is from the bottom of the mine um, about um, four months prior when it, was, when it was dry all the way to the bottom. And so you can see how much excavation and how, you know, how deep this tunnel is uh, and was at the time. Uh, but they took a handful of, 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 of really nice photos there. And in this one, um, you can see what looks like a piece of plumbing or a pipe kind of sticking out of the ground. Well, evidence would prove a little later that um, during the late 1800s, when mining was happening with the aid of, of steam engine, um, there was some plumbing installed there because the mines had a propensity to filling with water. And so they put some pumps in to try and remove water actively because they, they had a tendency to fill during the rainy season. So miners would be down in that area working and mining while they were literally filling with water and being pumped out. And so this uh, appears to be some leftover plumbing piping um, that was uh, 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 still remaining in the uh, abandoned part of the mine. And then as far back as they could get, which was described to me as only about, uh, from, that, from that previous picture, about 75 feet back, everything was collapsed and, and you couldn't explore any further. So you can really kind of make an L shape down around 75 feet. But where it was uh, collapsed in, there were still timbers held together with what's probably those square nails that would have been forged back in the 1800s. But this is, this is as far back as they could go, and you could see those timbers and logs that would have held up the walls uh, and other tools and things uh, 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 in the mine itself. So we came back when the weather was um, just a little bit warmer and just explored the outside of the mine and the area around this big uh, sinkhole. And one thing that we discovered after it, it, it had rained um, just a few days prior was that there were all of these little pock marks. They were, some were three feet in diameter, some were maybe six or eight, but these little pools existed basically everywhere, everywhere. And as you look down the hill, it rolled down and they were just like a golf ball, these little, these little spots all throughout. Well, that was evidence of, of miners having looked for the next, lane, next vein of lead and so they would have been doing surface mining, looking for that floating lead, and if they hit anything, they would have just kept going. And so because they didn't, they just kept digging. And what was left here are these pock marks that just extend, extended all the way down the hillside to a dry creek, and then it, it kind of dissipates from there. We got some good photography of the, the mining entrance um, and some, uh, some video as well, but by the time we had visited the mine, most of it had filled with water. And so um, we threw a few rocks down there just to see what, what kind of sound it would make and how cool that was. But, uh, but there, was no, there was no way we were safely exploring that space. Um, so we took some, some really neat photography and some video and just left that as is. Um, and then the state would uh, come in over the course of that summer and, um, and fill that in. And that's um, you know, that grade now having been filled up uh, and is more like a yard uh, as opposed to an old mining site at this point in time. So got some great photographs, I got some video, I've got a whole handful of different internet-based research, a lot of different hard copy stuff, so what am I going to do with all of this? Well, I can't write a book. I don't, I don't, I don't feel like compelled that I've got enough evidence to, to write a volume of information, but I do have enough uh, X marks the spot type information to turn around and make a timeline out of this. So I've got my earliest 1824, my, lady, my latest 1917, I want to turn this into something where I can cite all the way through and turn this into a timeline of Sandy Mines. And so I start taking the hard copy and digitizing. I'm going through all of those records that I found online. And then I'm taking the pieces that are most relevant in terms of the period maps. And I'm trying to put that in, uh, together um, as, a, as, as a timeline of events at, uh, within the Sandy Mines area. Not only the mine itself, but it, within that community. Because a lot, of, a lot of newspapers at the time would report on a variety of different community events. And so it, it really then turns into 
um, uh, a timeline not of just mining operations, but of all of people that were living and working in that Sandy Mines community during the time. So I also went through lots of newspaper transcriptions, those geologic and survey, uh, geologic surveys and railroad reports uh, that, that came by way of Google Books. And uh, in total then, um, we come up with um, a, a, a timeline of Sandy Mines and events that were happening in and around that area during that 100-year period. So if we go back to 1824, Sandy Mines is originally discovered. Now, discovery is a very subjective term because it's entirely possible that there were things happening in the mine and in that area well before 1824. But from um, a reported instance, 1824 is, is a place where uh, many reports indicate that mining operations were uh, um, established and discovered at that point in time. And then we have um, a 30-year period from its inception, 1824 to 1854, uh, where 5,000 tons of ore is mined from Sandy Mines. And we're talking about a time, even as late as 1854, we're still a decade away from the invention of dynamite. And so uh, doing just a little bit of math, and that, that is equivalent to roughly half a ton of ore every single day for 30 years, every day, no breaks. I mean, that's, that's, and we're talking about shovels and picks and manual labor throughout this duration of 30 years, 5,000 tons. A couple of other notable events in 1844 kind of helps put, uh, put uh, Sandy Mines and an X marks the spot on that map is a post office. That's an important thing to note because post offices mean there's enough people in an area for registered mail to be delivered. And then in 1874, and I, I want to say um, six, maybe seven years, Sandy Mines is listed as a registered township. That doesn't last for very long, but it is listed as a registered place in the state of Missouri at this point in time. So some really interesting stuff happening with that neighboring community. Um, some newspaper transcriptions that, that come out of the research. A pair of miners nearly lose their lives to a premature blast. We're talking about setting a charge of black powder, that kind of thing with a premature Premature blast, these gentlemen are, are, um, are, are, are near death as something uh, catastrophic happens while they're mining. Um, an argument ensues uh, as one miner nearly stabs another over a matter of 80 cents uh, in 1877. And then my favorite that comes out of this is the headline that, uh, 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 regarding uh, a miner who is also a jilted lover. He vandalizes the property of another man after his girlfriend takes residence with this gentleman. So he goes to the story that reads in the paper is that he goes to this other man's place and vandalizes his property and then absconds. He heads to like St. Louis County or something like that. And a posse gets together to go and, and extradite him back to Jefferson County. Well, during that process, they catch him and bring him back. The girlfriend expresses his, her love for this, for this gentleman. And everyone felt, I believe, I believe the way that it's written, everyone felt so good natured about it, they let him go. <laughs> So it just gives you a snapshot that things maybe aren't so different uh, in the 1870s as they are today, in a way. And then a piece of relatively new information, uh, my, my brother has taken up some of that historical context and research. Um, he passed this on to me just uh, about a month ago, really. Um, and I know it's real tough to read on screen there, so we've got a couple of captions from this. This is from the Jefferson County Democrat, and this is as late as 1874. The Sandy Mines at one time were known to be the richest in the state. Shafts that have been abandoned for 20 to 40 years prior, a new furnace has been built at the northern end of the load and is turning out between 3,000 to 5,000 pounds of lead per week. With the introduction of machinery, which goes back to that plumbing that I mentioned earlier, it is thought that in a short time, the old Sandy Mines will surpass the fame they acquired in the primitive modes of mining pursued by the old miners. And so what what other newspaper articles will demonstrate is that Sandy Mines had a propensity to being flooded at different times and being in, it not, not passable or workable. And so it would be worked for a season, and then that proprietor would either move on or go back to farming, and then another person would set up shop. And so that seems to be what happens in and around the late 1800s and into the start of the 1900s. And um, at some point then, um, they, they abandon the work on the mine, and, and we don't hear anything more after about World War I. Also pulled some drawings and some maps from a variety of different sources. This is around what's described as about the first 600 feet of Sandy Mines from a geologic survey of 1855. And you can see a variety of depths 
in shafts and tunnels, but we've got about 40 feet in one, 60 feet, 100 feet in, in another, and then all the way to the far left of this image is it's labeled vertically there south. I believe that what's labeled there is south are the images of that great big tunnel that I showed you, that opening that I showed you a few, few photos ago. That that would have been the place where perhaps machinery or the main entrance in and out of the mine would have been located. Um, and you have to then extrapolate this 600 feet out a mile in length. And that's, that would have been mining operations at its height uh, during the time at which uh, Saney Mines was in operation. Uh, this drawing comes from a geologic survey of lead and zinc deposits, deposits in the late 1800s and just gives you a sense of how the, uh, the veins of ore were um, registered in terms of their depth under the ground. And then coming back to my X marks the spot, I blended Google Earth with a number of different atlases. If you've been privileged to have access to either the 1876 or the 1898 atlas, these are like 11 by 17 books that have um, the registered landowners and a lot of landmarks and different things on them. And so I took pages from those and attempted to overlay those to find my own X marks the spot in terms of places I had been, places I had observed, and then things that were documented as long ago as this 1876 atlas. And so when we take the one and lay it over the top of the other, we've got our near X marks the spot. If we look at the Google Earth, Google Earth side on the left, you see the pinpoints from the south entrance extending to the north exit. And if we look on the right here at the 1876 atlas, on the right you can see a number of small triangles. And in the legend for that atlas, that, she's got one right there. Uh, in the legend for that atlas, um, the, uh, the, the legend indicates that those triangles are the presence of lead. And so I was so satisfied then to have found something as, as old as that atlas that I could say I'd found my X marks a spot and I knew that I had found sandy mines. So I pivoted on that after doing some research, giving some presentations. In fact, it was 2009. I was in the Missouri history class in the lecture hall next door to us when I gave this presentation for the first time. And I've continued the research since then. But since then, um, I have um, taken to doing a little bit of different, uh, different kind of research. And I've taken the, both the 1876 atlas and the 1898 atlas and digitized those in a way in which you can use them in conjunction with Google Earth as opposed to having hard copy and digital and just simply called that the Google Earth project. And so Google Earth, again, is this software that allows you to take satellite images um, all the way down to, um, um, and, well, Google has incorporated like uh, Google Street Maps into those views as well. Um, but you can do a lot of different things with the software that will allow you to, to take an image and overlay that over the top of the, the Earth satellite image. And so what I started with was taking those um, Atlas pages and digitizing them, scanning them from hard copy into uh, a digital uh, photographs, uh, files that I could then manipulate in a photo editing software. And so what I was taking is those big pages and cropping all that white space around the outside and making them a tight fit so I didn't have a lot of extra stuff uh, floating in that, in that software. And then going, coming back to this, I was, I was quite literally taking a file over the top of Google Earth and turning it into an overlay that looks just about like this. And so what I discovered through that process was that there's a lot of places that exist today in a way that don't really exist. And so when you look at what, what I discovered then is when you look at things like the um, condition of the railways um, or a place where a, a survey, you see these hard uh, 90 degree turns, those were survey markers, that even though those may have been subdivided 100 ways in 2023, Sometimes even the tree line will show you exactly what those surveys are on the satellite images today. And so what I was able to, to do then was to take these files and pin them to areas like the railroad trestle in Horine, if you're familiar with the area outside of Herculaneum, or the tree lines that existed uh, for the, the uh, survey, I think it says 2377 uh, in the Herculaneum area, as well as some of the railway markers, because um, as it turns out, Apparently, railroads don't move very much. When the rails go down, they tend to stay that way. And so I was able to, uh, with a little bit of stretch and move and rotate, pin page after page to a Google Earth product that gave you the entirety of the atlas in a digital format. So you could download a single file, and, and it will load in the entirety of the atlas, and you can then essentially see through 1876 into 2023. And there's a separate file for 1898 as well. So you can change the transparency of these areas with individual pages. 
Um, and so you can really kind of zoom in, zoom out, and see not only how things have changed, but also how things have not changed. So, all in all, I've taken all of the Sandy Mines research, um, as well as, the, as what I've called the Google Earth Project. I wanted to get that uh, shared with people. So I, I printed a small handful of books of uh, the timeline of Sandy Mines, but put together an online resource uh, where people could go and get access to not only the, uh, the Sandy Mines timeline, but also the Google Earth Project. So if you're interested in uh, downloading that Google Earth Project, there's a, a website here I'll share in just a minute. Um, but when you navigate to the Earth page, first off, you'll need to have the Google Earth software installed uh, for either your Mac or your Windows device. But you'll download on, click on either one of these globes, which will download uh, a Google Earth file. And when you open that in the Google Earth product, it will then import all of those pages, at which point you can start manipulating them with your own place markers and things like that along the way. So, so to wrap up the presentation this afternoon, um, again, having been so excited to be here, it's something to, something to take away is just that history is literally all around us. And we are really blessed with having a rich history here in Jefferson County, as close as we are to St. Louis County, and being one of, an, one of those early settled areas that being curious is the best way to find out what's happening or what has happened uh, in the area, which maybe your family still has property this day, or you're just curious on, on, uh, on where your ancestors may have, um, may have lived or worked uh, in, in generations past. Again, I can't say enough about our history center here at the college. It's volumes and volumes of information. And so if you're just getting started, that may very well be the best place to, uh, to go to start looking um, at what resources might be ahead of you or, or, or what adventure or rabbit hole that that might take you down. Uh, libraries uh, within the county are a great place. They hold a lot of, of, of our census records um, and have access to a lot of uh, newspaper records, some of them digitized, some of them hard copy. And then Google is everyone's friend if you can figure out how to find what you're, what you're looking for um, and sort through what can be sometimes a, a cumbersome list of, of extra information. But if you can find your way through uh, Ancestry.com or other areas that are genealogical or historical in context, hopefully you'll find uh, what you're looking for there as well. And you can't discount conversation with your family, with your friends, and those that have become before us um, because they, uh, they can sometimes hold the key to that one piece of information that can get you, get you to the next level. So, everything that I've discussed here today, you can find at the website where I posted uh, Sandy Mines as well as the Google Earth Project. That's historic-jeffco.com. And um, I appreciate everybody being here today. So, um, I'm happy to take any questions um, or thoughts or comments. Welcome We've got, Can we're going to, yeah, that is on. Here. Yeah, I just want to ask John. Don, does that mine go due north from Boat Place towards the creek? Yes, sir, it does. It does and is it 200 feet deep? At one point in time, it, it, yeah, the indications were well, up. If it, if it starts up by Boat and goes north, it, it, 200 feet, does it come out on the creek on the other side? Down, sure does. You know, through Linwood or that way? Yep. Oh, it does? Yep. Huh. Yeah, there's just a little fleck of a tunnel that's left um, that's open, yeah. and, um, and there, there are plenty of sinkholes that go right up to the edge of the farmland. Where that's all been filled in. Yeah, I've never seen. It. I remember yeah. I used to pick up my boat there. Uh, did they know who owned that all the time? Was it a corporation? Now that's th that's an interesting if it was a question. Corporation, that I, they would have records. You know, right. if it was, you know, you could look in the or in the, in the who owned it and see if it was a mining I, corporation. I, I don't have it digitized for this presentation, but I know that in our history center there is essentially an IOU book or a ledger that in, it indicates sort of the Sandy Mines company store, right. so to speak, that's got, it's a booklet about, I don't know, you and I have looked at that before. It's, it's a, a six inch by eight inch little ledger book that would have probably been run by a corporation. Oh, yeah. uh, in 1876, it wasn't in the Sandy Mine stretch, but on the hillside, kind of on the ridge of, of Sandy Valley, there is a, uh, a mining and smelting company that owns some property up on that hillside. Um, so it's entirely possible that there was a more corporate um, ownership of that area at times. Did they sell all? Did they sell all their ore at Herculaneum? That's and a guess. They smelt it down at Herculaneum. All that's time. that. That's a guess. However, um, there are um, both map and newspaper indications that they were at least rough smelting it there on site and then packing it to some other you know location. If they, if they would smelt it, yep. they'd have to have a, a, or a rock Firmus. like to do it over mine. That you know, yep. rock smelter to smelt yep. it because they said they used to smelt it in like a log. But that didn't last, it wouldn't leave nothing. You know? Right. And so, um, 
yeah, we're aware of some kind of a rough smelter that existed there at the Sandy Mine site, but nothing that would refine it to the point where they would be manufacturing something. It was to, to break it from the ore, uh, and then um, and then it would go to a more refined place. Money, they right. have to sell to somebody like yep. a company like yep. So I think it's reasonable to assume that most of it went to the went to Herculaneum, particularly in those days before the Civil War. Right. Um, but it could have gone south to Potosi. Um, there were some smelters um, in the the south the South Festus area, kind of uh, south of where the, the hospital is today. Um, and so it's reasonable it could have could have traveled there as well. So thank you, John. So my one comment is, as soon as you said vote, I went, what? <laughs> so my mom's a vote. Okay. And her, her parents, whose parents and whatever, uh, you know, lived in the area. And so I got this at one of the Jefferson College events because I saw the vote name in there. And I was like, hmm, it'd be interesting to see if I could figure out, but these maps are so hard to read. Yes. It, it's impossible to tell, you know, where this property really is compared to today. So amazing you're yep. going to be able to help me figure that out yep head, and head uh, this direction and um you can you can download that in um and generally speaking pretty rough in some spots because of how surveying was was different 150 years uh -huh. ago um it's going to be pretty close i think very cool yeah. my mom was going to join us and we were both kind of like ah, i'm not sure how helpful this will be <laughs> she'll she'll be like oh, i wish i was there <laughs> Yeah, Rhonda. Now, that, now, now. Yeah, last time I visited the property there, where where the where the mine opening was, it was Rhonda who owned the property at that point. In time. I don't I don't see any comments coming in via chat or online. John, you so, were talking about how things change, and it's funny because I looked at different plat books, and I saw, and even in 1930, Highway BB didn't go from Cedar Hill to Hillsboro. It went down from Cedar Hill to Glade Chapel. Really? And then turned towards where Glade Chapel Chapel is at. And then it went to 21. Yeah. And I didn't know that. And I always see right next to my house that where they blasted that rock, you can see the lines where they used the dynamite to mm -hmm. blast it. But they had to get permission from the landowner to run that through there. And a lot of them wouldn't do that. And they had to take different routes to run that right. road. Yeah. Which road? Which road was this? Uh, Highway BB. Oh yeah, right. No, when my wife told me they wouldn't give no bottom ground. Right. Yet, that's why it goes from the road up down to the top. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and then you were talking about different artifacts, and it's not about finding things, but it's the meaning behind it. Yep. That has the, the history to well, it. If you if you find um, a ceramic doorknob in the middle of a field. It's fairly likely there may have been a building there at one point in time, which is which is something that we have found on our own property. Um, and so there's some historical context just to the places that are soybean fields today that may very well have been the place where that old post office was located once upon a time. Yeah, on the farmhouse I live at, it's a century farm, and uh, they were going to sell the property, so I started using metal detector. But I sift everything, and I found a clay pipe, and it actually has a maker's mark on it. Yeah, it says Paris on it. So I know it was French. And then I was able to date it by the stem bore size. And it was, I thought it was from the trading posts in St. Louis, but it was earlier than that. It was 1720, it was dated. And I thought, well, who was there at that time? Well, Big River, Big River runs right behind my house. And Renault did lead in Potosi and went up and down Big River from the Merrimack. So I was able to make that connection. You'll never know where one one little connection will take you into a whole other world of connection. We do have one comment that came in, a uh, question via chat. Um, do you happen to know if any of the other Lindhorst ancestors, Schultz, Dittmer, Hesse, did mining at Sandy Mines? Um, to date, there's really been no evidence that any of those families mined at Sandy Mines. Um, like I said before, our, our, our Lindhorst ancestors and others were farmers by trade. Um, 
But there have been members of the County Historical Society that have done some digitization of some of the census records as best that they were able to. And so you may be able to query at the library or get a hold of some of those and determine um, whether or not um, some of the other family names that you're aware of may, may have uh, claimed minor as their primary occupation at any census time frame in the past. Uh, I don't know if you can answer this, but um, were you saying that they took the post office building and then just like moved it over to this other area? Was there, why didn't they just leave, you know, build a, have a house so in the, right, right where it was? Evidence, evidence would indicate that there was some kind of a, a rift in land ownership at the time and the property had been, been split or there was um, either some kind of a rental agreement that kind of dissolved or something. And so uh, when, that, when that all got kind of settled, they determined that they didn't want the house here, but it would be cheaper to physically move it than to build a new one. And so that was then the decision to then physically move it to the top of the hill and little, literally roll it there. Oh, they were going downhill. No, it was uphill. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yep. yeah out That's right. Land. That was right. Yeah, yeah. Flood, you're right. Floodplain in the uh, in, in the Sandy Creek uh, watershed area, for sure. Any other questions online? Nope, that's our last uh, question online. Other questions? I'm sure John will stick around. Yes, happy, happy to stick around. Sure. We have some real detailed information to exchange and share and ask Joe. Um, but let's give him a big round of applause. Thank you all. Thanks. Stopping the stopping.